Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to the eighth in this season's uh, Digital Classes Seminars. Um, we're extremely um, fortunate to have here uh, Maria Vieros from Helsinki, um, who's a postdoctoral researcher in papyrology at the Finnish Academy there, um, and um, who I've actually known for quite a long time when I figured out this morning how, how many years since we first <laughs> met, I decided I wouldn't, I wouldn't mention it. Um, but um, she's going to speak to us today about papyrology and linguistic annotation, two subjects that are both of which are um, things we've, uh, we've talked about before in this series, um, although not, as far as I recall, in, in combination, um, and how can we make TEI, Epidoc, XML, Corpus, and tree banking work together? Maria, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks for having me here. Um, yes, so I guess I could describe myself as a linguistically oriented papyrologist, uh, meaning that I have done papyrology, editing papyri, and but mainly I have used papyri already, in already published form, doing linguistic analysis on them. And I have been interested in digital tools for as long as I can remember. <laughs> uh, uh, but I don't have any deeper technical skills in programming myself. So I just everything I say for, with that. So um, uh, my project at the moment is called Sematia Linguistic Annotation of the Greek Documentary Papyri and funded by the Academy of Finland. Um, uh, but the word project is a bit grand, uh, it's only me who, who gets paid. <laughs> um, so what I'm pro going to talk about today is uh, very, very much uh, work in progress, uh, uh, not really presenting answers to the questions I, I post in the title, <laughs> but some suggestions. And my talk will be divided in uh, three, three branches. First, a little bit uh, of papyri as a linguistic source, sort of introductory branch. And in the second, uh, I'll discuss a bit about uh, digital tools in papyrology and, and uh, linguistically annotated corpora in general. So there might be stuff that many of you know already. And the third branch will be the most important one where I will discuss what I have been doing and what my uh, ideas are of how to proceed. So first a little bit about my viewpoint on papyri as a linguistic source. So I, first thing we have to remember that language is uh, not a monolithic entity. It changes all the time. Uh, there is lots of uh, synchronic and diachronic varieties, uh, lots of aerial and uh, social uh, variation. So variation is, is the key word in my viewpoint. Usually if there is a language change, for example, what historical linguists are interested in, there is a lot of synchronic variation preceding that change. There are variants competing before one of them gets consistent. Uh, so we get information about history of the language, but also the other way around, studying variation tells a lot about the community and a lot about the people with whom they have uh, interacted with, perhaps where they come from, or all sorts of contact phenomena, for example. And for modern linguists, uh, it's easy for them to do field work. They go out to collect data from people. They distribute uh, questionnaires and make interviews. But for ancient languages, that's not, of course, possible. But you know, with ancient Greek, we are, we are very, uh, very lucky that we have the documentary papyri that are really written for uh, everyday purposes. They were not meant to last. Moreover, 
papyri are often uh, survived as archives, so we get uh, contextual information about uh, the people who are acting in, in different texts. So archives constitute often as a sort of uh, speech community, which in, in social linguistic research is, is very important. But of course then we have to remember that we are dealing with written text and that uh, places different kinds of layers over the text. We, are not, we can't take that as a spoken uh, language. Uh, there's education in writing, education in spelling and of course formulaic language, uh, which in itself can be a matter of study of course, but uh, too. But often uh, these uh, layers can be filtered out also and we can get to get very close to the uh, language spoken and language used by the people. So I have just uh, three uh, little uh, examples of what sorts of uh, features linguists might be interested in, what we find in papyri, and I'll use the examples later on as well. So, orthographic mistakes, of course, tell us uh, sometimes how, how things were pronounced. Uh, this uh, example comes from a colleague of mine, Sonia Dahlgren, who is studying uh, in her forthcoming thesis uh, the impact of Egyptian phonology on Greek vowel orthography based on the Narmutis Greek ostraga. So on the top there we have the standard genitive of the noun wheat, Buru, and below there's two different uh, variants we find in the uh, Narmutis Ostraka, Buru and Buru. So the latter example uh, uh, reflects the internal Greek development, the merging of U and Oi. But the former reflects more of the uh, Egyptian influence. Uh, Egyptian language did not have the vowel, front vowel, U at all. And so Egyptians writing Greek very often confused the, the uh, U and U sounding vowels. Um, moreover, here uh, the stress of the word is, is on the last syllable and the orthographic variation is, is on the first. So the stress in Egyptian was very strong and that uh, might be a feature here as well. Um, so it seems that we have here uh, Egyptians writing Greek but they are also aware of the uh, Greek, the spoken uh, Greek development. And the second example comes from my own, own thesis. Um, the names underlined in black there uh, are in the nominative case, but uh, in standard Greek we would expect them to be in the dative case. And um, so is this an example of not knowing cases? Uh, I came to the conclusion that basically it's more of a pra uh, pragmatic strategy, sort of a, there's a phrase uh, initial element here actually to the first brother that they have some tails is in the dative and then a, a sort of common noun for the brothers, those other voice is in the dative before we have the names which are sort of in parentheses. Um, so the writer did not think it's, it was necessary to, to inflect those names too in the dative. So there's an Egyptian uh, influence also because Egyptian did not have cases uh, and the, the marker to whom something is given is marked in, in the beginning of a noun phrase. And the third example comes uh, from another colleague of mine from Helsinki, Amarti Leivo, who studied the imper uh, the directive forms, and in this case, the phrase uh, kalos poieses, 
which is please sort of colors, uh, you do well, and 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 it's complement. So in usually it's thought that colors poiesis uh, has an aorist uh, participle complement, but in papyri we find all sorts of things, and this is one example in the Mons Claudianus Ostraga. Uh, the writer wrote Pempse. And now this is particularly vexing in this <laughs> example that we cannot be sure what what did he mean. He did he could not mean Pempse, which is a third person singular, but there there's the infinitive or the imperative structure that we could argue that this is. All of these were probably pronounced uh, in the same way, Pempse. So the last uh, syllable uh, is just a schwa sound, the stress again in the first syllable. Um, so in this case we cannot say if we have, we could have infinitive with the phrase kalos uh, es or an imperative. So further studies would be needed. But these kinds of phenomena could be studied and found but how, how do we actually find these? Basically, usually uh, linguists select some sort of archive and think, start reading it and see if there are interesting features. But digital tools could, could uh, be a way to improve the situation. So, uh, a little bit about what we have in papyrology. Uh, as digital tools and then about linguistically annotated corpora. So the corpus of papyri in digital form is already, it has a very, very long history. So from 1988, the CD-ROM made uh, by the Packard Humanities Institute. And I remember using this CD uh, and I even found it in, in our uh, papyrus room in Helsinki. <laughs> To scan it. <laughs> so uh, uh, we used it for a long time with the search program called Pandora. Uh, but technolo te technolog technological de development went further, and and now we are very lucky to have the Papyrological Navigator, which has the same texts but uh, more, a lot more. So in 2009. The papyri.info uh, was released, and now I think it's safe to say that no papyrologist could live without it. <laughs> so it uh, uses uh, several uh, databases, and and the base is uh, TEI Epidoc XML, in which the texts are there. So. Uh, First, you know uh, what is it's possible to do, but I think there are many people, in, for example, in Greek linguistics, who necessarily do not know what papyrological navigator can do for you. So I'll just say a, quickly a few words about that. So we have 70,000 Greek texts there. So it's a vast amount of data in already in TEI XML form. It's something that we can't do. <laughs> not to use in linguistic studies too. Uh, so it's possible to browse and search the text, images and metadata with different parameters like date range and provenance and such. And then search the text themselves both with string searches, lexical searches, regular expressions. And the very important feature is the papyrological editor uh, via which uh, the papyrological community can keep the data up, up, up to date, so suggest new texts and, and suggest emendations to the old ones. So, for example, the lexical search, you can have all the inflected forms of one word in one search, so the word algorithms in all, all inflected forms in this search, or the regular expression with either the word written either with epsilon or e or eta. 
and I guess uh, the string search is the most used type of search people do there, at least papyrologists. So here I, I did the search uh, for puro uh, in as well, uh, beginning of the word, the example we had already. So here you can see that it's quite a rare autographic variant of, of wheat. Not even all these eight hits are, are actually the word wheat, but there are a few names as well. The interface shows the text very much uh, like a, a, a traditional edition. So you have the text there and then the apparatus where you have the uh, editorial comments. So here basically what should be read in, in these instances. And the XML behind this uh, looks like this. So I'm showing this mainly because you, know, you can see that we don't have the word boundaries or the sentence boundaries marked up. And that would be important later. Uh, so, so this XML is of course severely cut from the header. <laughs> and, but the text is there. And then you can also see that the markup uh, is very often happens inside a word, for example. Here we have the unclear uh, character uh, where the tag is in the middle of the word. And then the regularized, what the editor thinks we should read, is next to what we have in the original. So here we, the ori orange tag yeah, gives us the uh, form we have actually in the papyrus. So I wanted to show these as well for later use. So what is not possible to do in Papyrological Navigator? We can't find orthographic variation except for the cases like I showed before that you have the search and word you are searching. But if you would want generally to know how often Omicron Ypsilon is written instead of Ypsilon, it's not possible e even with the reg X uh, search because then you have to have uh, one, one letter on. Um, or any kind of linguistic structures. So if you want to find a preposition with certain non-standard case or, or genitive absolutes in, in, in weird formations or the example I showed earlier where we have nominatives in, in a noun phrase where the heads are in dated. So we cannot search these kinds of instances in, in Papyrological Navigator. So we should tag these forms somehow linguistically in, in a form a, a corpus. We have uh, lots of different uh, uh, linguistically annotated corpora around being somewhere <laughs> there and I just by example mention this one project which has been going on very long for historical Englishes so in, in Helsinki University they have collected many of these uh, and tagged many of uh, the cor uh, different corpora for different historical Englishes so they have for example corpus of medieval uh, medical Middle English text or early English correspondence. So they have arranged these things uh, topically and, and, and by, by the date. And then the corpora there are not always uh, annotated following the same guidelines, so the corpora are, are very different between themselves. For Greek, for ancient Greek, we have actually two. Uh, tree banks existing. So the Perseus, Ancient Greek and Latin Dependency Tree Bank, and I'll talk more about it later. They have basically poetry. Uh, so epic, Homer and then drama. A very little prose. And then the Proyel Corpus uh, in Oslo. Uh, Greek is only one language there. So it started as a 
comparative corpus of different uh, translations of the New Testament. But now they have uh, uh, gone further and they also have some Greek literature there and Latin and other European, Indo-European languages. Uh, then uh, there is a project going on for annotating uh, papyri uh, in, in uh, Madrid. Uh, Daniel Riano Rufilanchos has a program Aristarchus and he uses it for uh, annotating Greek uh, literary papyri, basically philodemos. But uh, I have not been able to try that yet. Uh, it's not fully ready, as I uh, understand. But there is lots of going on at, at the moment. So, very quickly, what kind of studies people usually then do on based on, on these corpora? That's what people always ask. That if you have a linguistic language in the corpora, what kind of studies you can make? So of course a lot of quantitative uh, studies, but for example the Barrier uh, project ha has already 14 volumes in their e-publication series. Uh, many of the studies of course first uh, tell us about the method and how the corpus has been compiled, but there's, uh, uh, there's uh, lots of uh, interesting linguistic studies also done. And also, of course, outside the e-publication e -publication series. For the Proel Corpus, uh, for example, this article first describes how the tree bank and the corpus has been compiled and annotated, but then there are three sample studies at the end, which are solid, solid linguistic studies, uh, very nice ones. For the ancient Greek dependency tree bank, for example, Francesco Mambrini has done a lot, and this article with Marco Passarotti, they have concentrated on non-projectivity, non and their underlying idea is also for uh, to study this feature because it uh, effect, has an effect on if we can uh, actually develop a, a syntactic parser for Greek. So there is no automatic syntactic parser yet for ancient three. This is one uh, feature perhaps inhibiting it. A very recent article by Giuseppe Celano has made, made use of both of the tree bags. So he has studied the word order, uh, the, the shift from object word, uh, word, word, word order to verb object, uh, which is uh, commonly known uh, development in Greek, but uh, now he studies quantit quantitatively corroborate this. Uh, and the article also is a nice example of how he had to make the queries different when when studying the same feature from first from the Perseus tree bank and then from the Proyel tree bank. The Proyel tree bank is also uh, quite near uh, the Perseus tree bank. It has been developed from that, but it, it's more, a bit more elaborate. But so the queries for these two tree banks are, had to be made quite different. So you always have to be careful when designing uh, the, the linguistic, li linguistic annotation and uh, the building of the corpus because the corpus is only as good as the data you insert there, of course. So what's the ratio between how much work you actually put on, on the annotation and then versus what, what you get out. And that's one reason that I thought that I should be trying to use the same uh, already existing system for the papyri and uh, <coughs> I, I turned to study the uh, Alpheus, the Perseus tree banking system for this reason so that it, it papyri would be compatible with the uh, 
the literary corpus they have been annotating. So that, that's also, also building a bigger training data for possibly try developing the syntactic parser later. So, uh, Perseus tree banking is based on dependency grammar, which was first developed for Czech, the Prague dependency tree bank. Um, so, dependency grammar is not a very detailed uh, linguistic theory, it's just based basically head dependent dependency uh, based on the head dependent uh, relationship and it's good for languages like Greek which have relatively free word order and inflection. And the Perseus tree bank is TIXML and their annotation service which is called Alpheus now uh, divides the text into sentences, gives the sentences IDs, and then each word is um, automatically annotated for morphology, the Morpheus tool, but uh, semi automatically actually because the annotator has to check whether uh, the suggested form is correct. And the syntax had to be, has to be done manually. So, first we have here uh, an image from the older Perseus annotating uh, environment, so table form, where you uh, have the words uh, uh, on top of each other and then you choose what is the head of each word by using the word by the number and write the relation and check the lemma and morphological uh, analysis and if it's not correct you can add a new lemma. But now we have the newer, uh, more visual, more graphic interface Alpheus which does basically the same thing. Uh, and the example sentence here is from my uh, test corpus of papyri. This is one of the rare cases where the sentence is so short that it actually fits on the screen. <laughs> screen. They are usually uh, two kilometers long at least. So first when you start you have a flat tree and uh, then you click each word, you check the lemma and the morphological analysis and then you can just drag the dependent words under their heads and then uh, add the syntactic relation from the drop down menu. So here uh, is the ready uh, tree and here on the bottom you have the XML form of, of the same. So you notice that well, this is a test corpus, so now <coughs> test example also, so the sentence ID is number one, but that would of course be a non running number, same goes with the words, but you have the sentence IDs and you have the word IDs for, yeah. so each word has the form that it's in the text, then the dictionary entry dilemma, then the post tag, uh, which I'll tell you more soon. It says there that the ammonius is noun singular masculine. And then you have what, what is the head of this word, which is number five, and the relation there now is the subject. So the post tag uh, tells, gives you the whole morphological analysis of the, of the word, the part of speech, the person, <clears throat> the number, the tense, mood, voice, gender, case and degree. Always what, what, whatever is applicable to the word in question. So with even just this basic morphological analysis, I, I think that uh, uh, the papyrological corpus would be very much more usable for linguists than, than it is now. But as I said, for example, the Proyer corpus is a bit more elaborate than this. 
So let's move on now to the third branch and my, my problems <laughs> and wishes. So I um, selected a test corpus of 50 documents and we downloaded them to the Alpheus annotation service. I chose documents that I already knew. So the documents I had uh, analyzed in my thesis. And first thing we encountered was, of course, that the annotation service did not support Epidoc XML. So the, all the markup was breaking up the words. So of course the tool did not know what to do with single letters or <laughs> half of words. As some surprisingly didn't uh, recognize them. So there was an XSLT style sheet to strip away that markup, which is done actually in Papyri.info in every search that is made. Um, so we could have the words back together and, and the service uh, know, know the words. But that of course meant uh, very much <laughs> loss of important papyrological information. What is in the papyrus, what is not, what is something that some later editor has added there. And at this point I have to thank uh, Bridget Almas from, from Procures and Hugh KS for uh, providing me help with this, this matter. Uh, and then we had of course two versions with the uh, original tags and with the regularized tags. Uh, I made the bad choice of choosing only, only one of them. I thought that we only need to annotate what is originally in the papyrus. But okay, okay, this is test corpus. <laughs> Mistakes are allowed. So both would be better. But then uh, the abbreviations there are in the exp expanded form. So that's of course uh, contradictory, con contradictory to what I just said about having the original text. Uh, and then uh, the supplied words in the lacuna are of course there just as they are and that's not truthful again. So quickly, uh, the example I showed before actually has two abbreviations. So we don't know if the first word is masculine singular. We don't know if the verb actually is first person first person uh, singular. And I made the decision then to tag only what we actually see. So I would leave out. I would leave blank the. Uh, person and number and mood and voice from this annotation. And especially the lacuna if we would just tag everything as uh, they are. So with this sentence where we have the long lacuna uh, there marked in the red, it would be very misleading to have the sentence as a whole there, especially in this case because I know that the relative pronoun most likely could be something else than it is there in the, in the supplement. So the editor supplements according to standard grammar, but I know that the uh, notaries could have very well made a mistake in the relative pronoun there. So the annotation is very slow and you really close read the text when you do that. So you learn a lot and you get new ideas. So that's very good. But then there are minor bumps <laughs> I uh, uh, that came uh, sort of in, in, in the way of the annotation. Firstly, the typos which are in the text in the Papyrological Navigator where we took them from. So sometimes there was a missing space, so two words were clustered together and okay, how you can't put them into a tree if they are together or the 
uh, tool does not recognize what form it is. Sometimes there's just a you know, K instead of L, just a typo. Uh, then there was this interesting feature that uh, different editorial practices reflect, for example, in the sentence division. Uh, I might have two contracts which were written within a week uh, in antiquity in the same place, perhaps by the same notaries, using the same formulas for the contract, but then the texts were edited in very different times in very different papyrological collections and the editor has put the, his dot in a different place than the other editor so the sentences, the syntactic trees are very very different and then of course there were words that were not recognized by the tool, Egyptian names and words but that's not really a problem, we just need to be consistent of how to deal with them. Uh, I have now used the Trismegistos names, for example, as a standard for the lemma, for those. So, this was just to say that I think the annotators should somehow have a chance or a possibility to make some minor changes in the text while he is annotating. Uh, well, the typos, not necessarily in the sentence divisions. But then, of course, you have to make the changes in the topological editor, too. And that's what I've done. And they really like my missing spaces, I think. <laughs> so now, what I think the direction should be then for for annotating papyri. So this is now uh, the entering into the dream world. So I think we should have several layers of annotation for the same text. So we should have the original form or the original layer where we have only what is in the papyrus, the origin and sick tags, and no expanded abbreviations, no forms who uh, the important markers are in the lacuna, for example. And then we could have the standard layer where we have the emendations of the editors, the core and reg tags, and the expanded abbreviations and supplied forms in lacunae. Then, of course, uh, there are often several different uh, competing emendations or competing supplements. So I guess we then should have sub-layers for the standard or something like that. And for the syntactic tree, I think it might be best then to have, have it from the standard layer only, only one tree, because sometimes the original, there's not enough there to, to make a real syntactic tree. And it will, probably wouldn't look any different. You would just have empty nodes more there. And then I propose also a sort of new variation layer uh, based on, on the original layer, a new tag set that I will say more about soon. But then how to actually manage these different layers. Uh, I was thinking that pro possi one possibility is a database management system like, such as uh, Exist. But now uh, there is also, uh, I just heard from Bridget Almas uh, in, in, in Tufts that they are, uh, as we speak, they are developing the per, their Perseids platform quite a lot. So they might be going to the direction of sort of multi-layered annotation and perhaps even if, uh, if my which is hard heard, uh, they probably could be supporting Epidoc XML then. So that's something we need to wait for first. So, so for the variation tag set, this is just a sort of ad hoc uh, suggestion, names and uh, things could change. Uh, there are, in the TEI, there are different analysis elements, but none of them seem to be very uh, good for my purposes. So, 
this is something I, I think we could add here. Uh, basically we need this only for phonology if we have the layer modeled. Because if we have the original layer and the standard layer, we already have the differences in the morphological analysis between the different words. But the phonological uh, layer uh, level is never present there, specified. So we could have uh, an element called variation, but uh, with type phonology, and then I think we sh could just use beta code for what well, here is value or something else for the letters we have like in Puru example we had Omicron Y and not Y and in the PEMSE example we had Epsilon but not something else and I guess we could use a question mark there but even uh, more useful this could be for the uh, phonologically inclined linguist that uh, we could also describe the immediate surrounding of, of the letter, of the variant. So in Puru, the Omicron Y appears before P and it appears after R sound. And in Pemse, it appears before C and it after a word break. So here, for morphology, we could use the post type, for example, but as, as I said, if we <laughs> use the layer model, we do not need to do this, I think. But if we do not use the layer model, then this variation taxon could be a lot more elaborate. An example of a study where sort of two layer system has been used uh, is uh, by still another colleague of mine from Helsinki, uh, Timo Korkia Gangas, uh, who has uh, annotated uh, late Latin charters in the Perseus tree back system. And his uh, idea, uh, his interest is in the development of the case uh, system. So uh, he also bumped into the same problem that there are uh, uh, abbreviations in these charters and, and damage in the text. So after his annotation he made a second version, a uh, second layer where he just added an expand tag uh, to the word uh, which is uh, abbreviated and a damage tag to the word where there is damage in, in the inflectional ending. So with this layer uh, he could then uh, discard those examples uh, from the queries that actually are just abbreviations or, or in damaged parts of the text. So how then keep the Paparological navigator with, within the layers of Sematium. So at the moment, I, I see this as a sort of a triangle. We get the text from the paparological uh, navigator or the data bank, and um, then we annotate the text linguistically in Alpheus or some other. Uh, Linguistic, a linguistic annotation service, so the layers, original and standard, and after that we could add the variation tagging with the text, and then we have the same Matea database layers where we can then handle the searches. But uh, if we have the layers, it's not anymore so relevant to know the original uh, paparological markup where the, where the gaps are since we have the different layers where we have this information uh, but the paparological navigator of course has a lot more uh, metadata and other data of the texts so it would be very important I think that 
these are, are uh, kept sort of talking with each other with each other. And as I've been told, the pathological navigator at the moment cannot handle such a uh, linguistic uh, tagging as, as I was proposing there. It's too much to add there, but perhaps we could have, for example, the word IDs, or maybe rather just the sentence IDs, as a standoff markup uh, added in the, those uh, pathological navigator texts. Uh, which have linguistic annotation. And then we could have link between, between these two databases. Then of course how to keep in sync with the uh, changes happening in, in the PN texts. So if the edit, via the editor somebody poses something new. So Seamantia would need to be kept in sync too. But of course when we have the link there is no such hurry then to keep them in sync. So, I want to thank, as I said already, Bridget Almas from Perseus uh, and Hugh Kalis and just uh, Sosin for helping me with, with this and discussing uh, with this, uh, about these problems. And if anyone has any suggestions, Here's my email. So this was sort of the direction I'm pro proposing that we should uh, take when thinking about the linguistic annotation of the papyri. But as I said, this is very, very much work in progress. And uh, I, I welcome all ideas. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, fascinating. There's uh, so much in there. Um, I think it's weird, as we discussed at the beginning, you're, you're, really, you're asking some really essential questions here and you're, you're looking at ways in which the, um, the technology might help you answer those questions. Uh, in, in many ways, I think it's much more exciting to have that sort of presentation than someone who comes along and claims to have all the answers. So I think it's, um, it's very useful to, to have this sort of, um, um, sort of presentation of of the, you know, of the real linguistic research questions that are, uh, that are in there. Um, I came up, I had a few, a few questions and comments that came up as, um, as you were talking, and each one, about 10 minutes after I wrote it down, I crossed it out again, because you answered it a bit later. Um, the, uh, <laughs> no, no, that, that, was, that was good. Um, but, um, and they were, all, they were all quite fussy technical things anyway. Um, the, um, the one thing that I, um, that I, sort of wanted to think about was where you talked um, early on about one of the things that's not um, possible to do in the Papalogical Navigator, which is find uh, linguistic variants, um, you know, phonological um, spellings, for example, mm -hmm. automatically. Um, uh, and while, yes, you're right, it's not that something that's completely possible to do using the Papalogical Navigator interface, there, there are ways you could try and pull that sort of information out of the data. Um, and I, I, so I, a couple of years ago, I, I did an exercise because we were, um, we had to, we made a decision about the way we were going to represent the data that had implications larger than we'd expect, and we then ended up having to spend several, probably personal weeks, fixing the data in order to um, present it this way. And what this meant was that every form that had previously been tagged as an original form, so the, the, the papyrological form that was not regularized, um, the papyrological navigator now presents that as the default form in the papyrus. The old tube data bank used to present yeah. the corrected form, yeah. the, the normalized form as the default form. We decided to reverse that, so, so you know, quite correctly the papyrologist would see the thing. But the problem was every single original uncorrected form in the, in the entire tube data bank was unaccented. Right. And so that didn't look good. So we had to figure out ways to get the accent in. And as a result, we had to write some scripts which found the two words in parallel, the reg and the oric, um, where the only difference between them was one syllable or multiple syllables were spelled differently. So we found, in, in a sense, we basically wrote a search, and it wasn't a simple search, we wrote a search that found every instance where the reg said upsilon and the oric said on pronouncement. 
Right. So exactly the sort of thing you were you were asking for. So you, you can do that sort of search. I mean, obviously you wouldn't, uh, you can't do it through the interface, but it might that might be an interesting. And I wonder to what degree. I mean, I mean that doesn't that doesn't invalidate everything everything that came after. But I wonder that degree that sort of thing would be useful to do as a first as a first pass. Yeah. You'd probably only have 90% accuracy. You'd find some instances of that which weren't actually that correct, and you'd miss some instances that were. Yeah. But I don't know to what degree that would be useful to have that that list of such variants. To yes. start with, so you don't need to hand tag more. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, good to know. I, I didn't know that. I, I knew about this uh, uh, process going on, but I didn't know that, that you had to do this kind of strict script mm -hmm. for the accents. Yeah, that's, that's good. good to know. We have to think about that. That's the question that we just yeah. I mean, we don't, I mean I, I'm, I'm not saying that that data we have to hand that you could immediately have it, but that, that it right. would be relatively easy to reiterate the sort yeah. of data. Yeah. That was, that was the only one of my thoughts that I didn't cross out. <laughs> Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Yeah, I have something very broad to ask because it's not my area at all. But I would like to say thank you very much for your presentation. I learned a lot from it. And I particularly like your template. It's very accurate apt. And I'm going to steal it for my teaching classes, I think. But my, my, my question was, with, with this, um, with this uh, documentary power that you're using, what is the, the, the type of the content of the text that's contained within this? Because as I say, it's not my area. And does it make any difference to what you're doing, the type of the content? And do you have to be selective about what you choose from within the corpus? Very good. Uh, very well, you're broad, doing very broad question, yeah. 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 yeah, because that's true. We have several different text types. We have contracts with uh, form lake, thanks. And we have lists, lists which are boring <laughs> and not very much uh, of a sentence structure and, and letters and, and such. And, and I chose only contracts that I already knew. Uh, I think actually how, how things could or what's meaning meaningful way of, of, of proceeding if this goes further <laughs> uh, that people can choose uh, certain kinds of uh, corpora by themselves based on criteria they are interested in so somebody might choose a, a corpus of, of uh, letters to certain officials or somebody might choose a corpus of, of uh, tax receipts and annotate those. I think we should proceed by different smaller subcorpora who which can uh, which are chosen for themselves by certain parameters so that they are a small representative corpus by themselves for certain questions. But then and as if things go out further then we have a lot more different Text types annotated. Um, but these are generally all official documents of some sort. We have uh, personal letters. We have personal letters. Yeah. I'm thinking of the, the language, if you're looking at the, the change of language, if, if they were all from one sort of specific uh, yeah. typology. Well, if yeah. you one. The letters have, uh, I think, been. Uh, on the sort of focus for many linguists because they seem to present a lot more interesting features than, than some contracts. But like in, in, in my thesis, I, I did find very much interesting features in just official contracts okay. too. <laughs> so shouldn't overlook uh, boring looking documents. <laughs> Any other? The question that you characterise as the, um, the rear two legs of a pantomime horse, because I'm so ignorant about these matters. Um, words in the Greek have gender, and the Egyptians <coughs> got some of the things when they were using Greek, got that wrong. Did they get the gender wrong? And other, another case, in terms of gender, did the gender of words change over time sometimes? Uh, gender. Uh, 
I don't recall any exact examples of mistakes of that kind. But I don't think anybody has looked into it very much in detail. No, I can't answer that. <laughs> but you might be able to have to done all the research. Right. Right. <laughs> I have another question, which is again a very vague question, probably so, so vague it's unanswerable. But um, you're so you're basing your data set on both um, words that have been normalized by editors, pathological editors, and that have found their way into the Duke Data Bank, and on information that comes out of true banking that has been done by hand by you or by, by other people. Um, and if you're using this data set to ask linguistic questions and, and you know, come up with linguistic theories based on the data, um, all of those regularizations and all of that tree banking is based on previous editors' linguistic theories and assumptions. To what degree is this going to be too circular to, be, to give you much new information? Uh, well, basically that's why I do want the original layer mm -hmm. to be the most prominent one. Right. And, and the uh, standard form. Well, of course, we could also study the language concept of the editors, <laughs> but, uh, but that's true. It doesn't tell much about the, the real Greek used by, by people in Egypt in those days. So, I mean, the basis is on, on the original papyrus form, but mm -hmm. in all circumstances we don't have the whole sentence preserved, so that the syntactic annotation could be certain, the, the, the tree, for example. Okay. But basically, I don't see uh, that we are basing the, 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 Atlantis, the linguistic research on, on the editors. Mm -hmm. and that's what I want to avoid. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>